We uh, are so fortunate to be able to gather here around God's word, have him speak to us through it, and to praise his name together. I've got a few announcements to go through with you here. Uh, as you can see, today is Communion Sunday, and so all who believe and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life are welcome to join us here at this table. Uh, because it is Communion Sunday, we place that special emphasis on our love offering, that fund that goes to those in our congregation with special financial needs, and you can, you can see a special basket in the back for that. Operation Christmas Child is uh, done today, and so those boxes, those shoe boxes, if you have any left, uh, needed to be returned today to the church. Those will be shipping out this week. And uh, we had scheduled a joint board meeting for tonight at 7. That needs to be postponed, uh, possibly to next week. But uh, I will, when we have a little more uh, concrete details on that, I'll send an email out to elders and trustees about that. Also, we will be holding our our Thanksgiving service this week, Thursday, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And that is a nice, uh, informal, but uh, an, uh, wonderful service to give thanks to God for all of his blessings to us throughout the year and always. So Thursday at 10 a.m. And then when we hold that service, we also do take up a special offering for International Missions Famine Relief. And so I encourage you to prayerfully consider giving to that. Again, we have adopted a Valley Women's and Children's Center family, and uh, that's a mom, two little girls, and a newborn baby boy. And so those uh, items, if you have signed up for, for supplying some gifts for them, uh, those are due back to the church next Sunday. And there's a table in the fellowship hall, uh, all organized for those gifts, and you can place them right back there. And uh, any questions, or if you can offer anything towards that, please see Marge Coleman. Children's Christmas program. The practices for that are going to be beginning next week. Uh, those, will be, those practices will be happening during the Sunday school hour. So starting at 9.30, and the practices will be held here in the sanctuary. And so if you are an adult, uh, class member. Uh, your adult class will be held in the fellowship hall next week. And then the Christmas program itself is going to be happening December 20th at 6.30 in the evening, and we'll have a birthday party for Jesus to follow after that, and encourage you to bring a treat to share for that. Women are holding their Christmas party December 3rd at 6.30. That's always a wonderful time. It's the time when the church gets decorated. There's going to be uh, singing some Christmas carols, a devotion, as well as gift exchange. Five to ten dollar limit on that. And uh, you're encouraged to bring an appetizer or a dessert to share for that as well. All ladies are invited to the women's Christmas party December 3rd, 6.30. And then a reminder once again that if you are in need of assistance around the house or running errands, that kind of thing, the Serving Sisters are there to help. Alice Davis is your contact for that. Her email address and phone number are in your bulletin there. Any other announcements you need to get out there this morning? Very good. Well, in that case, I will invite you to look with me to our call to worship which today comes from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 4. And you can uh, see that in your bulletin there or up on the screen here. But let's read Psalm 95, 1 through 4, out loud together. O oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods, in whose hand also the depths of the earth, the peaks of the mountains, are his also. Amen. Praise God for that. Let's do sing our songs to him this time, starting with hymn number 36. 
Hymn number 36 is now Thank We All Our God. Would you please rise as we sing this hymn together? seated. And so at this time, I get to invite up Andy Knudsen, who's going to be sharing a scripture reading with us this morning. Good morning. Uh, I'll be reading most of First Chronicles 16. And it's always right to be thankful for what God has done for us. Uh, but with uh, our 50th anniversary celebration last week, uh, communion Sunday today and Thanksgiving later this week I wanted to read this uh, song of Thanksgiving that uh, David wrote when the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Jerusalem uh, so first Chronicles 16 1 and they brought in the Ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God and when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, and second to him were Zechariah, Jael, Shemaiah, Ramoth, Jehiel, Mattathiah, Eliab, Benaiah, Obed-Edom, and Jael, who were to play harps and lyres. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, and Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day, David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Israel, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute. 
to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When you were few in number, of little account, and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord, all the earth, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering. back to praising God in his song, this time at hymn number 250. Hymn number 250 is Jesus is Coming Again. Hymn number 250, could you please rise as we sing together. Hymn number 256, All Fly Away.
please remain standing as we now turn to our gospel reading, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And once again, I'll give you a moment to find that in your own Bibles, if you're following along there. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. You may have noticed that we are uh, reading a lot of verses and singing a lot of hymns about Christ's return, about our our future in him. Uh, That is because we are in the last Sunday of the church year. Next Sunday starts Advent. And so that focus has shifted to uh, the work yet to be done by Christ in restoring all things to him. And so we come to a place here where Jesus uh, is wrapping up his answer to the disciples when they're asking uh, when the, will this be and what will the signs be when these things occur and so Jesus gives us a bit of information on that Matthew 25 31 through 46 reading in Jesus name but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. So the the doctrine of justification by faith is... The doctrine that we must preach consistently, constantly. I I practically beat it into the uh, confirmation students I have. It's that doctrine which, of course, is said that the church stands or falls. And it's it's our battle cry that we've got to uphold above all things. That we are justified, that we are made not guilty before Christ's judgment throne by faith in Christ alone. And so if we get this wrong, then our church is no longer a Christian church. It then becomes a church that is based on the religion of men. And I've got to bring this up because if we get this central, foundational teaching wrong, then our text for today gets irreversibly warped, right? Our text for today becomes a champion for works righteousness instead of justification by faith. It becomes a text that says that it is through our good works that the sheep are welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. And it is the failure to do good works where the goats wind up in the eternal hellfire. Right, and so to do so would make a mockery of the one true religion of God and would make us no different from all the other man-made works righteousness religions that are out there today. And we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to take a really close look at what Jesus is saying here. We're going to take a good hard look at the justice of Christ. 
in the nature of the good works that are being talked about here. All in light of the fact that it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this not of yourselves. And so as we consider the justice of Christ that we see in this text, we need to sort out a few things. And the first thing is that this text speaks of the future of all mankind, right? No one is excluded here. There's a definite universality to the words all nations here. And it is very, very important that we realize that. It's very important to, to God that we understand that the judgment at the end of time will not be reserved for just a certain group of people, right? His judgment will not exclude another group of people. But that judgment will encompass all nations, all peoples, Jew and Gentile, male and female, living and dead. There is no one who will not stand before this judgment throne. And the next thing we need to understand about this judgment is that there are some for whom this judgment will not be favorable. For others, the judgment will be. But for some, this judgment is going to be terrible. And we need to lay that down because that's an unpopular notion today, unfortunately. It's an unpopular notion because, first, some don't want to believe that at the end, there will be goats, right? We want to believe that in the end, everyone is going to be saved. That there will be no one who goes to hell. And as attractive as a thought as that may be, and as much as it tempts us to soothe our consciences with such things... To believe this is to deny the truth of God's word. There are sheep and goats here. The first are judged righteous and they're welcomed into God's heavenly kingdom. The second are judged evil and sentenced to eternal punishment. Jesus Christ, the rightful king on his rightful throne, will dispense royal grace and favor with one hand and dispense perfect justice with the other. And to believe otherwise places you in dire danger of finding yourself on Christ's hand, left hand on that day. And what's more, there's a distinct absence of a third class here, right? We don't have sheep, goats, and say camels. There's no third option. See, it's another invention around us. You probably have heard that perhaps those who have never heard the gospel or those whose faith was misplaced but who, who lived good lives, just believed in a different God, will enter into some kind of place of pity where they're not damned, but maybe they're not in the kingdom of heaven either. Scripture does not allow for such a thing. All right here we are told that on, on no uncertain terms that this judgment will be either or, one or the other either at the right hand of Christ or at the left hand of Christ. And if you're not in one, you're in the other. Now, taking a step aside for a moment here, doesn't that truth create in us a real sense of urgency as we consider the mission that Christ's church is on? See, the focus on our text here is not evangelism, bringing the word of God out of the world and and sharing the gospel. But how can you not consider the importance and the gravity of this mission that Christ's church is on? Now that we're armed with the knowledge that there are those around you who are hurtling head first towards Christ's left hand of judgment. But back to it. Now that we know how Christ's judgment is going to occur, we need to sort out the reason for that judgment. In other words, is this judgment just? Is he right in judging the world this way? And in order to determine whether the judgment is just, we need to look at the facts of the case, the evidence that is presented here in this courtroom. This is where we need to look at the nature of the good works that are performed by each group of people. And the righteous judge sums up his verdict in this way. 
He himself was hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, and imprisoned. Right? And the ones who are not guilty fed him, gave him a drink, invited him in, clothed him, visited him, and came to him. Not just sometimes, right? But always. And the ones who are guilty in this scenario failed to do these things. And not failed sometimes, but failed every time. So, with that evidence, is he right in this verdict? And this is where things start to get difficult for us. This is where the water gets a little muddied from our perspective. Because we consider this verdict in light of our own lives and, and in light of the lives of the people around us. So for starters, let's look at the sheep on his right hand because even they're surprised at the verdict, right? They're surprised. When did we see you like this? They ask. See, based on what we know about our own actions, we are not the compassionate, caring servants we are judged to be. See, that's the topic behind the question there. After all, you know full well that you've never acted consistently when it comes to what God's word expects of you. So one of the first things that Christ brings up here is this mystical union that all believers have with Christ our Lord. As our Lord, through faith, we love him. And that love evidences itself in service to him. But seeing that he's not present with us here bodily so that we can come to his aid when he's hungry or thirsty, how can it be said that we have served him? Well, remember first that before we loved him, he loved us. Let's start there. And his love for us was a perfect love. And it still is a perfect love. Whatever misfortunes happen to us can be said to have happened to him because of this great love he has for us. He is truly in us and we are in him because of this love. And so as we suffer these things, he suffers these things. It's like a parent looking at their child falling down, scraping their knee. We feel bad for them. We feel for them. Right? It happens to them, but it seems to happen for us so much more with Christ. And so every time you serve one of your brothers or sisters in Christ, it is true that you are serving Christ himself. We have a unity with him that is spoken of in such a way that we are his body. And so as we serve each other and love each other, we are serving and loving Christ himself. But that's only a part of the picture. Okay, so we've had opportunities to serve Christ himself by serving our Christian brothers and sisters. And we've probably all acted on those opportunities at one point or another. But there's a huge gap between the things that we were able to accomplish and the things we ought to have accomplished. We have not loved Christ with our whole hearts. And therefore, we have not loved and served each other with our whole hearts. We know this to be a fact. All of us have failed to act completely selflessly when it comes to serving and aiding our Christian brothers and sisters. And so if we know this to be true, is Christ's judgment of us right? Is it just? How can he say that we have served him perfectly and deserve his kingdom. And it's on that question where, again, we stand or fall based on the doctrine of justification by faith. Because if we get that wrong, then there are only two possible ways of viewing Christ's not guilty verdict here. Either he is not just, and he is simply overlooking our failures, in order to come up with this favorable verdict. Or he is just. And precious few will enter on the basis of their perfect good works. 
And just in case you're wondering, by precious few, I mean none. Because there is no one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. However, neither of these unjust possibilities are possible because of what Scripture teaches us about being justified by faith. It is faith alone that makes Christ's judgment here favorable. And that is because by faith we are justified. By faith, every time we have sinned by failing to serve Christ as we ought to have, we receive the perfect atonement and forgiveness that Christ provided for us on his cross. By faith, we stand before Christ's judgment throne, having had all the sins, all the sins of failing to serve our brethren, removed from us. Completely removed. As in, they are simply not there in this day of judgment. Because of Christ's perfect atonement and forgiveness, we stand before his throne as people who have never failed to perfectly love our brothers and sisters. Never failed to perfectly love our neighbor. All because we get to claim Christ's righteousness as our own. And so whatever good works we have done, we're done with this underpinning of faith. That faith sanctifying and perfecting those works so that they are holy and acceptable to our perfect judge. Because of the existence of faith in you, and because of faith alone, Christ's judgment is perfectly just. Because we do indeed stand before him, having perfectly served him. Our failures having been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Which now leaves us to analyze the second judgment. The judgment that those on his left hand receive. What's he say about them? They, they have never served him. And that by extension they have never served the needs of the brothers and sisters in Christ. And their surprise is very similar to the surprise of the sheep. When did we see you in trouble? When did we ever have the opportunity to serve you? We never even saw you. Well, that's true. They never did. They never saw Christ. Even though we know that by the time Christ returns in judgment, the gospel will have been preached to every corner of the earth, they never saw Christ. They never saw Christ in the ones who were bringing them the gospel. They never saw Christ in the words of that gospel. But rather, they rejected him. Now, this group of goats is maybe a little easier for us to imagine. We can easily reconcile this judgment on those who we see are nothing but evil, right? We all know, or at least know, of people who are so in love with their sin, but they do nothing but treat people terribly. They're always looking out for number one. Right? They don't give the least thought to serving or helping others. We know that those types will be in the group of goats. That's easy. However, it's also true that it's going to be more than just that type of person in this group. It's also true that in this day of judgment, there will be people who have had who have lived visibly moral lives. People that the world at large would look at and say, you know, they're good people. They're, they're kind and compassionate. They're giving, loving, they're generous. There'll also be people there who've done great things, all in the name of Christ, but to whom Christ will say, I never knew you. And no, no doubt about it, some of these people will have been kind and generous to our Christian brothers and sisters, maybe even to you yourself. And so if that's true, then is Christ's judgment upon them right? Is it just? Well, as it turns out, yes, it is. As Christ looks at all the works that these people did, he recognizes none of them as having been done to him. Whatever these supposedly good works were, whatever those works were done towards, Christ sees them and declares them that they were not done to him 
Why? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's Hebrews 12, if you need to look that up. Because of their lack of faith, their works are presented to God as those dirty rags we keep hearing so much about. The substance of those works are containing nothing that is pleasing to God. Christ's judgment on them is perfectly just because they stand before Christ's judgment throne in the exact opposite state that the others do. Doing works on earth that are not sanctified by Christ, works that cannot possibly please God. And in addition, they are standing there with the sum total of their sin still clinging to them, destining them, according to Christ's perfect judgment, to an eternity of hell, forever separated from even the possibility of entering God's kingdom. And so which, which are we going to be? Once again, whenever we read something like this, we have to place ourselves in it and say, which one am I? I want to be a sheep, right? Don't start singing the song yet. But I want to be a sheep. I don't want to be a goat, nope. But you don't want to be a goat. You don't want to lack faith in Christ and so live out a completely fruit, fruitless life that will end up you being a stranger to Christ. Instead, be a sheep. Trust completely, not in your own works. Don't place a, a speck of trust in your own good works, but trust completely in Christ's righteousness. <laughs> It is Christ's righteousness and his alone that will stand you up on that day to where he will look at you and say, you served me in all the places I needed to be served. Because it is by that faith alone that you will be confident that it will be his righteousness given to you that will gain you his favorable verdict. In fact, you'll be so confident so completely trusting in the cross of Christ that you will completely forget to keep track of the ways that you have served him. You don't give a second thought to the righteousness of your own works to the point that on that day you will be amazed, saying, when did I ever serve you like you say I did? And then, in that day, giddy with joy, you'll enter into your eternal heavenly home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we so much want to look at our own good works and, and see them as the basis of our deserving heaven. Lord, may we be surprised. May we see that our, our works have contributed nothing to our heavenly future and that it was all Christ. Who want it for us. Lord, if we do accomplish anything good, let us not boast in ourselves, but in you. You have taken us, hopeless sinners, and created us to be your servants. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, before we go to the Lord's Supper, we turn now to hymn number 478, Abide With Me. Hymn number 478, would you please rise as we sing together.
Please remain standing as we begin the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's now hear the gracious invitation of our Lord given to us in the Holy Scriptures, where from Matthew 11:28 28, we read, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And from John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now let us confess together our faith as it is expressed in the Apostles' Creed. And you can find that in the front of your hymnals or on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11.28 encourages us to examine ourselves before partaking of the body and blood of Christ. In the Spirit, let us now take time to confess our sins and receive the absolution that is promised us in Scripture. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And it's not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. I'll just remind you again that we will uh, have you come up pew by pew. The uh, men up here will distribute the elements to you, and then we'll all partake of them together.
This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ has now given you his holy body and blood through which he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto everlasting life. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now let us pray together the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Well, now is the time when we like to give an opportunity for you to share. If there's something that you're particularly grateful to a God about, uh, some way you, you've seen him working and moving among you, your family, your friends, well, feel free to, to chime in. God. He has been good to you and yours and, and uh, with the rest of the kids, you know, it's, it's always difficult, if not impossible, to know what he's doing through any given situation. But, uh, in time, in time we will. Thank you. hit noon, and so I won't uh, make the awkward silence go on any longer than I need to, but if there's no one, no others to chime in, I'll invite you to please rise one last time. Receive this benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.